Uh, thank you for coming for a morning session. I know it's a big effort here. Um, so thank you. Thank you for showing up. Um, just two quick things. Uh, I do tend to speak quickly. I apologize. I also have a lot of stuff I'm going to try and get through um, and also still leave time for questions. So um, apologies in advance if I go really quickly, but we will have time for questions. Also, I'm going to be showing you a lot of tools and websites and stuff like that. Don't worry about having to write everything down and if you miss anything, I'm gonna give you one link that will take you to a Google Doc that has a list of everything, every single resource that I'm showing you, as well as a bunch of other ones that we're not gonna get into today. And if you keep that link, I continue to update that document over time. Um, so don't worry if I talk about something and you forget to write it down, it's all gonna be there in a document for you. All right, great, so here's what we're gonna do. Uh, we're going to talk about some what I consider to be really essential browser extensions that you'll probably want to install uh, and that will help you with some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about. And then we're going to look at sort of diving in in a few areas. So social media, videos, and uh, photos, sort of verifying those as well as examining accounts on social media. And then we'll look at uh, investigating websites, particularly who owns it, are they connected to other websites, um, and then we're also going to look at kind of analyzing traffic patterns um, and advertising on sites to see if there might be some shady stuff going on or just to understand more about sort of how the site gets its audience and where it comes from and where it goes and those kinds of things. And then as I say, we'll leave time for questions. All right, so um, here is the link. Um, I'll show it again at the end, but it's, it's bit.ly slash verification tools and tips. And that will take you to a Google Doc, as I say, that has tons of links, stuff organized in different areas. It also, at the end of it, has links to all of my slides as well from this presentation. So yes, so you will get access to those as a PDF file. And there's links to other really great websites and resources that you should use for this kind of work as well. You know, this I, I'm not covering everything in the world we can possibly do. There's tons of other people who do this stuff as well. Uh, but hopefully this gives you a good kind of grounding in, in diving into these areas, and you can go on more stuff from there. All right, uh, I'll show this again at the end, but hopefully you all grabbed it now. All right, uh, quickly, this sort of, you know, the way I think about doing this stuff, and my job at BuzzFeed is, is you know, very much focused on reporting on and investigating all aspects of digital deception. So yes, that means like fake news and misinformation and all that, but um, we've also published a series on uh, advertising fraud, you know, people who are using fake websites or fake traffic or manipulated traffic to steal money from advertisers online. Um, and so we'll, we'll look at that a little bit. And um, so in terms of how we approach what we do, we're just always really obsessed with, you know, what websites are doing and what publishers are doing and what are the new ad networks that people are signed up with. And so we're just constantly obsessed with this stuff. And I think that's the best way to actually, you know, find stories on it is to think about this stuff every day. But the second way that uh, I think it's to be really effective is to think about this in a long-term thing and think about data collection over time. And that doesn't require programming skills or anything like that. I can't, I, I can't program. Um, what things we do are, you know, we create spreadsheets and we build lists of websites of certain types of websites that we want to watch. And we track these over time. And we use tools like CrowdTangle, which I'll show you a browser extension for in a section, to build lists of Facebook pages or Facebook groups so that we can go in or get alerts every day. And if you collect data over time, you start to see things, you start to connect dots, and that's, that's how you find a lot of stories. So that's the piece about the ongoing monitoring and data, data gathering. Um, general things to think about is remember it's a networked environment. How are people interacting with other things? How are websites tied to each other? What are the networks out there that you can look at? Uh, and also, you know, how is content flowing? Like, who is sharing it? Does this website get shared by the same pages or, or Twitter accounts over and over and over again? Again, where does their traffic come from? And so you want to get that picture of not just the thing you're looking at, but the things that it's connected to and, and how it's gaining things like audience and other elements like that. Um, I'm going to show you a lot of tools but that's not like a magical thing for doing journalism and finding stories. The tools help you answer questions that you might have. So you need to understand what context and why you're using these tools. They're not, they're not magic bullets. And tools also come and go. So if you are using one like a crutch you know, for your work, you should be prepared that it will disappear at some point because this is a really common thing. Um, and then you know, the last two things, honestly, 
the you know the great thing about an open democratized media environment is is that many more people can participate there are many more voices so much more participation the other side of that is it's very easy to manipulate it's very easy to scam and game um, and these massive platforms are they're so big that actually managing them and, and you know enforcing all their policies is basically impossible so people are gaming everything every kind of service every kind of thing you can possibly imagine someone has figured out a way to mess with it and so that for me means an unlimited amount of stories um, and the last thing you know aside from uh, reference to the Hamilton musical um, but never be satisfied means you know you, you've never you've never learned enough tools you never learned enough techniques you know you've never done all the stories that are out there because the internet is so big you're never gonna master it all um, but that's that's a good thing so you know being that relentlessly curious and obsessive but also wanting to learn on a constant basis because this stuff evolves all the time like some of the stuff I'll show you now three months from now there may be a better way of doing it so you can look at this now but you got to sort of stay with it all right so here are, here are four key browser extensions that I really encourage people who want to do this work install um, this one right here is called invid stands for Invideo Veritas. This is a great, it's like a Swiss Army knife for verification stuff, for photos and videos. It has a wide range of tools and things you can do. I'm gonna show you a couple of them, um, how you would use them. But, you know, it can give you basic kind of video analysis. Um, it can extract thumbnails from a YouTube video. I'll explain why that's important. It can give you the metadata of a photo. I'll, again, I'll show you why that's important. And it has some other tools built in there. So, Invid is just a great tool that does a lot of things things that you should have in your browser. Um, there's also the Internet Archives Wayback Machine plugin. A lot of times websites go offline, or you're looking at a website that is online, but you want to know what it looked like, you know, six months ago or two years ago. And so having this browser plugin, if you put in a URL and you go to a website and it's not there anymore, if the, if the Wayback Machine has an archived version of it, it will show up right in your browser telling you, hey, would you like to see an archived version of this website? So I think that's a great tool. The other reason you can um, use it, which is uh, really nice, is it has an option for save page now. So if you're looking at something and you want to archive it to make sure if it disappears, you still have an image of it, you can hit that button and it's going to save it for you there. It'll be part of the Internet Archive, and that's that's a good thing for everybody. Um, last thing here also is, um, you know, and it gives you, you can go back to the first version of what they had of it, the recent one. Um, it also has linked to a tool called Alexa for that particular website. I'm going to show you how you can use Alexa later on. So it's got a couple shortcuts for you that are good as well. So those are the first two. Um, and then two more here. So I mentioned CrowdTangle already. This is a free tool. It's owned by Facebook. It's a great way of analyzing engagement on Facebook pages, in Facebook groups, also for a Twitter list, also I think for Reddit. So it's a really good tool with a lot of, a lot of options for you. Um, they also have a browser extension. And so when you're on a particular article or web page, if you click on it, it gives you a report of the Facebook interactions that have taken place for that specific URL. And uh, the thing that I look for most out of this is to understand who's been sharing that particular piece of content. And if you hover over the little the little bubbles there. It also tells you what the sharing text was that they used to share it. And the reason why that's really helpful is that if there's a network of pages that are all sharing the same piece of content because of a financial relationship or an ownership relationship, sometimes they will just literally use the same share language. So that's another way to indicate, oh, I think these pages might be connected together. So it's a, it's a really good tool, pops up very quickly. Last one here, very powerful detailed tool called Ghostery. Um, and it's one, it's a great thing to use just to understand how much t ad tech and tracking tech is on your average website. Like the insane amount of stuff that loads when you go to a web page. Ghostery is going to show you that. It's going to show you the different advertising trackers. It's going to show you analytics trackers. We'll talk about why a Google Analytics tracker is a good thing if you find that on a website. And so it's going to show you, uh, in particular, all of the kind of advertising networks and ad tech players that a site works with. And that helps you understand how they're monetizing. Um, you know, in this case, I was on a site that had 20 trackers. Honestly, like you can go to sites, some of them have like 40, 50, 60 trackers on them. And so again, just on that basic level, it's going to reveal to you how much crap is loading and how much stuff is being gathered about you as you're going around on the internet. So that's Ghostery and that's CrowdTangle. Again, it's all in the, the document I'll give you. Um, okay, so 
This is, I, I'll probably go even faster through this section because like photo and video verification stuff, I think, you know, there's a lot of resources out there, a lot of people talk about it, but it's always good to reinforce. Um, these are some rules about social media verification from Claire Wardle at First Draft, which is a great organization with lots of training materials in this area. Um, when we're looking particularly at photos and videos, as you probably know, a really common thing on the internet is someone, you know, a breaking news event has happened, someone shares a photo and says, hey, this, this is from the event, you know, a photo from 10 minutes ago. The photo may actually be from that location, but maybe it's three years old. So this sort of time shifting thing happens a lot with videos and photos. Um, or it could be from a completely different location from you know, years or months earlier, and people share it trying to pretend like it's this current thing. Happens all the time. Um, and so some of these guidelines here will help you avoid getting fooled by that. We are always trying to find the original piece of content. So who took that photo? Who shot that video? Um, we need to get back to that. Who first shared it? and talk to them. Talking to people never goes out of style, it's a part of everything. Um, and so that's, you know, that's the piece of who. You gotta find the person who shared it. And, and a really good question you always wanna ask people is, is this your photo? Is this your video? Because people, it's not even a malicious thing. They don't think to necessarily tell you as a journalist that, oh, by the way, it was my friends and I don't know where he got it. Um, they may not, you could be doing an entire interview with them and they will never mention that to you. So you have to ask, it's really important. Um, and then of course you want to confirm location and you want to confirm time. Uh, because maybe it's an old photo, maybe it's an old video, you need to figure these things out. So keep those in mind uh, as you're going through stuff. Uh, and then, you know, some of those things about, you know, the where and the when, the stuff that you can look at. So you have a lot of evidence in a particular photo or video. You can see street signs, you can see license plates, you can see buildings and other landmarks. All of those things are stuff that you can take and compare to, say, Google Street View or other elements like that. So you're going to sort of put on your detective hat and look at everything in that photo and see what it's telling you. If it's a video and there's sound and people are talking, what language are they speaking? What accent of that language is there? These are all really, really great clues uh, that you can have. And, you know, a lot of people also, you know, they'll look at, like, well, how high is the sun? Roughly what time of day is this? These kinds of things. So there's a lot there for you to look at. And you want to, as you're, as you're examining, it and watching the video or looking at the photo, you've got to just look at everything in it, every single piece, you know, divide it into little quadrants or whatever, and make sure you're not missing any element that's there. Um, so this is one of the most basic and useful tools that are out there, reverse image search. Uh, basically, you know, services like Google and others build massive databases of the images that they crawl and find online, and they're able to actually identify the same image that is, you know, in different places online. And so for Google, it's you just go to Google Images, you click on the little camera, <clears throat> it pulls up a menu, so you can either paste in the URL of the photo, not the web page it's on, but it has to be the URL of the photo, or you can upload the photo. And it's gonna scan all of its database and show you all the other places online that that photo has existed. So in this example I talked about where maybe somebody shared a photo from four months ago and presented it as new, if you do a reverse image search and you can see, oh, this photo's been online for at least four months, you know that it didn't just get taken. Um, so it's really useful. You can also do reverse image search for videos, as I'll show you in a second. Um, and of course, when you're looking at social media profiles, you can reverse image search you know, their photo to see, is this actually this person? Is it one that they've stolen from somewhere else? Um, so we, we talked briefly about all of the stuff that you can see in a photo or a video. Then there's all the data that you can't see. Um, this is the, the data about the actual file. It's called metadata. And so every time a digital photo is taken, and videos also have metadata, there is information encoded in the file itself. And the way that you can see that with a photo is to use an EXIF reader. Um, this is an example of the kind of thing you can see. Um, this is like, this is the holy grail example. The, most of the time you don't get this. And the first thing you need to know about EXIF data is that if something is uploaded to a social network, all that metadata is stripped. So this is again why we find the person, we figure out who has the original photo, and we ask them to send it to us because then we can actually run the metadata and confirm that yes, this is like a large file size, it has the data around it, that helps us know that this is actually a camera original, as people say. In this case, you know, we can see like what phone took it, we get, this is why it's the holy grail, like latitude and longitude, most of the times you don't get that. Even, you know, you get the, the data of the date and the time, but getting the actual location, people often don't have that enabled, but sometimes you get really lucky. So we're looking at the content, and then we're also looking at the metadata, the stuff that we can't see with the naked eye. 
Uh, now, I mentioned Invid. Invid does give you the ability to get that metadata, so you don't have to go to a separate outside uh, EXIF reader. Um, it also, you can get metadata for videos. So this is, again, why it's great to have Invid installed. Um, so I mentioned reverse image search for videos. When a video is uploaded to YouTube or Vimeo or another place, those services usually automatically extract thumbnails. So you know when you first come to it, it's usually a still image. They extract one or several thumbnails. And so what you can actually do is use this tool to extract thumbnails from the video. And then Invid has quick searches, because there's multiple reverse image search tools out there. So it has Google, it has Yandex, which is a Russian uh, search engine, has TinEye, which is a good uh, reverse image search tool in particular, because it will show you the oldest version of a photo it has, so you can try and figure out when that, like, when was this roughly taken. Um, and it also has a Twitter video search to figure out who's been sharing it on Twitter, and oftentimes finding out who shared it first might be a good way to figure out who shot this video. So you can do a reverse image search on the thumbnails, and um, the other thing that you can do is, on a video, you can actually just take a screen capture of a, of a particular moment. If you think there's a frame in a video that is particularly newsworthy and people might actually have been screen capping that or what have you, you can do that, take a screen cap of it, of just the image, not all the st other stuff on the page, uh, and upload that to a reverse image and, and see what you get, because sometimes you'll get a hit. So reverse image search works not only for images, but also for video. Um, here's, a, here's a quick tip. It works not only for YouTube, but also for Instagram. Um, every photo and video on Instagram and video on YouTube has a unique string, uh, an ID in it that's in the URL. In the case of YouTube, it's everything that comes after the equals sign. So when you have that, that is unique to the video, and usually what I do is I Google it. I just put in the code, like here. So you can see, see that, and it pulls up other web pages that have that video, articles about the video where it's, maybe it's been embedded or what have you. And I also will plug that code into Twitter so I can see again who first shared the video, who's been sharing it a lot, is anyone claiming ownership of the video, that kind of thing. So that unique code that is there for Instagram, that is there for YouTube is really helpful. You can um, search with that and, and put it out there. And you often, it's a good way again to find that person, hopefully. Okay. So let's talk about social media accounts here. Obviously, you know, somebody has shared something, we need to look at their account and figure out, like, do they seem credible? Is this a real person? All these kinds of things. Some basic questions, you know, reminding that point off the top, this is, this is, this is a networked environment, so it's not just that account, but, you know, who are their friends? Who are their followers? Who do they interact with? What conversations do they have? What's the most recent content that they've been sharing? These, you know, whether it's uh, Facebook or Twitter or whatever, always looking at that. Try to figure out where they sit within the larger network of things online. Um, I always, I always look at the Facebook groups they're in as well. I, I look at a lot of people that are sort of, you know, maliciously spreading content, and usually they're using groups to do that because it's an efficient way to get in front of people. Um, of course, you want to check when the account is created. That's very easy on Twitter. You can see that right on the account profile. It doesn't instantly mean it's fake if it's really recent, but you know, your suspicion goes up a little bit um, if it is pretty recent. And the other thing is that people often reuse usernames across different platforms. So even if you're really interested in a Twitter account, please don't just look at Twitter. Take that username, search it, see if you can find other profiles, take the real name they're, they're claiming that they have, see if you can find a LinkedIn profile and all of these kinds of things. So think about cross-platform searching. Don't just stick to the one that you're particularly interested in. And of course, talk to people. You know That, that is always a fundamental piece of journalism. Um, all right, so this, there's a, um, a search ability on Facebook called Graph Search, which is really remarkable. Um, I, it, it's also, they're not working a lot on it on Facebook anymore, so people like me are constantly concerned that they're going to just like turn it off at some point. But while it's working, it's pretty amazing. Um, and the key thing here to note is that it will only show you stuff that is public. So if somebody is sharing things only among their friends or liking a post from a friend and that, that friend only shared it as private or what have you, you're not going to pull that up. So this isn't invading any kind, any kind of privacy or getting around privacy settings that people have put on their Facebook account. That being said, 
frankly, a lot of people forget what they're doing on Facebook is public in a lot of cases. They forget that interactions on other people's profiles on Facebook may also be public. And graph search in this particular interface here on Michael Bazell's um, Intel Technique site is a great way for you to look at what an account is doing not only on their profile, but elsewhere on Facebook. And so if we look at some of the stuff that's here, we have the ability, for example, to look at photos that they've liked, photos that they've taken, pages that they've liked, places that they've liked, um, videos they've liked, video comments they've made, so on other videos that are on Facebook, comments they've made. This is getting an understanding of where people have been on Facebook and the interactions they've been taking. Um, the way you do it basically is, you know, you take their username minus Silverman Craig, you pop it in here, that gives you a unique Facebook ID, and then you can use that ID to populate the rest of the search fields. In the Google Doc that I gave you, um, not only do you have a link to the Intel Techniques one, you have a link to two other services that offer you the ability to do different kinds of Facebook graph searches. So, um, so take a look at those, and depending on what your need is and what you're trying to understand about an account, you might want to use all three of them just to see. Um, some of them offer the ability to see interactions between two accounts. So are there, have they ever been in the same place at the same time or checked in at the same restaurant at the same time? These are things you might be able to find if they've been doing all this stuff publicly. Um, here's a tool for Twitter. If you need to really do a deeper dive on somebody's Twitter account, it's called TweetBeaver, and it enables you to, d to download data about their account in a really easy way without you needing um, to you know, know how to hit the Twitter API. Um, so you, know, you can download their friends list, you can download their followers list, you can search within a user's friends biographies to see what they might have in common and these kinds of things. Sometimes bot networks have similar bios or what have you. So this is a really great way to just download a bunch of stuff about a particular Twitter account that you happen to be interested in. So that's Tweet Beaver. Um, I also always remind people that LinkedIn is a really powerful people search tool. It's also a fantastic tool if you need if you're looking into a company. You know, when you're looking into a company, one of the first things you want to do is find some former employees who might talk to you. And LinkedIn can actually give you that on a platter. Um, the search interface, by the way, has changed a little bit, but you can still find it there. Um, I search all the time for you know past employees um, and and also current employees to get a sense of how big a company is. A lot of times. Um, for certain scams and um, sort of sting operations, people are setting up, you know, fake uh, profiles on LinkedIn, fake company profiles on LinkedIn, populating those. So, you know, there, there is a lot of that stuff going on on LinkedIn as well. Um, so it's great for people search. It's great for understanding, you know, how many employees a company might have. But it's also usually factored into scams and sting operations that people are doing in the corporate realm. So you, you will find stuff on LinkedIn a lot of times in those cases. Um, last thing to note is that, like every social network, LinkedIn has certain default settings, and usually they're trying to get you to, to share as much information as you can. I mean, this is, like, this is like the conflict or hypocrisy of journalists. We're like, remember to protect your privacy, but also, oh, I hope everyone shares everything publicly, right, for my stories. This is like the reality of what we do. So just to note, when you get into your settings under privacy, um, if you don't want people to see that you've been creeping on their LinkedIn profile, you're going to want to make yourself show up as anonymous LinkedIn user. Otherwise, all those people at that company will know that, hey, there's a journalist who seems really interested in all of us. This is maybe a signal that something's coming, right? So think about that. Um, adjust your privacy settings. Overall, adjust your privacy settings. Um, all right, so let's let's head down the road to investigating websites here. Um, so I'm going to look in particular at who is data and talk a little bit about um, IP data and how this stuff can be interesting. And we're also going to talk about how you can use um, if someone if a website is part of Google AdSense or using Google Analytics, how you can use that to kind of connect it to other websites out there as well. All right, so this is a really good free tool called Domain Big Data. Um, it, at the core of it is a database um, called like the Whois database. Every time someone registers a domain name online, so like CraigSilverman.com, that is registered in a database. Um, and so what you're able to do, at the very least, you're able to do a Whois search and find out when a domain name was registered. You will always be able to, to know that. But there's other information that you may or may not get which can be really helpful. I mean, at the extreme of it, you can not only know when a domain name is registered, but you can know who registered it, what their phone number is, what their email address is, maybe what, what company they're attached to, and then also see what other domain names they may own. You don't know what you're going to get. Sometimes they've paid to have privacy to block all that information, but I'll show you a way that you may actually be able to get um, connecting domains even if they've made it private. 
So domain big data, I, for me, I think it's maybe the best free service. Um, a, a little note that uh, Domain Tools is often very happy to give uh, journalists access to their amazing investigations platform. Um, so if you are with uh, a larger news organization, I think they have a bit of a bias. Domain Tools, amazing paid service, may actually be willing to, to give you access there. But if not, Domain Big Data is a pretty good free service. All right, so like I said, you know, one of the things that you can always find out is when a domain name is registered. So in this case, it's, it's in 1994. It's going to tell us um, you know, how old that domain is. You know, just like social media accounts, newer domain names may be a little suspicious. Uh, and so we get that information. In this case, like we're, we're pretty lucky because we're going to see um, you know, the organization. We're going to see a location. We're going to see a phone number. Um, we also get to see, again, how many other domain names that particular company is associated with. So if you want to get a sense of like what other sites they may, might own, this is a really great way to do that. Now, obviously, people who are doing stuff that's a little bit shady tend to pay for privacy, but sometimes they forget. And if you have access to domain tools, you can look at historical who is records. So if someone five years ago bought the domain name, didn't know they were going to do something shady, didn't pay for privacy then, and enabled it later, you can actually go back in time and look and get their name in that historical record. And we use that all the time, um, and it's really helpful. Um, and so, you know, the, the thing to note about the email address linked to a domain name is that people can make up whatever information they want in a domain name registration. They can make up a name, they can put in a fake phone number, it happens all the time. But of all the information you find, if you're a little bit suspicious about it, the email is maybe the best one because when they registered the domain name, they probably want an email that they have access to so that you know when they need to renew it and things like that, they get notifications. So that email address is often your best hint in a domain name registration record. Um, and just to give you a sense of, like, that's a, a nice cleaned up version that Domain Big Data does, but typically, like a who is record, it sort of looks like this. And just the thing to note is that there's, there's the registrant of it, so like who bought and registered the domain name, but there can also be a separate contact for the technical element. So oftentimes that's the same person or company, or other times they might have like a third party that they work with to maintain their website. And then you may also get separate information as a technical contact there as well. Um, so IP address. This is the address on the internet of the server that that website is hosted on. Um, the, the general rule that I want to give you about IP addresses is that um, if you clicked on that link there to it, it would show you the other websites that are on that same server. The lower the number of websites on a particular IP address, the more interesting it is to you. Um, because often people, they will rent a server or they'll set up their own server and they'll put all of their, their websites on it. If you get a result that's like hundreds of thousands of websites, somebody has just put it on a very, you know, kind of group server um, that, their, that their host has put it on. So the lower number, the better it is for IP. Um, I will always look at the sites on it if it's, you know, for me, I always look and just do a quick scan if it's like 250 or less or so. Um, but really, like, that's still not a great indication that there's any connection between all of the ones on the server. I just might scan it to see if there are similar domain names there that have, like, similar name or similar topic to see, like, oh, maybe these are also owned by the same person. But if, if you're talking, like, under 50 domain names or, like, under 20, then there's, you know, the, the clue there is even more interesting. Um, but again, you have to, like, reconfirm that information. It's just a good direction-finding thing to say, like, all right, I should look at the other sites on this IP. Um, so I mentioned that people can pay for privacy. And by the way, this is a screenshot from Domain Tools' um, Iris uh, investigations platform, which is uh, a paid service. Uh, so in this case, we were looking into this company domain name Smart Innotech, which was part of a, these sting operations that had targeted Soros-funded NGOs we, we did a story about. And um, so in this case, I'm a little sad because, oh, they've paid for privacy. That's too bad. Um, but the good news is that some of the privacy services out there actually assign a unique email address, a unique anonymized email address to the domain name. And so in this case, what I'm able to do is kind of pivot on that and see, well, how many other websites have that particular anonymized email address as its owner? Um, and in this case, what we found was there was, I think, about 12 or 15 other, e other websites. So that's a low number. That's a better indication. And a bunch of the websites were all um, variations on the name of a Russian billionaire oligarch. 
Uh, and what we discovered was that there was a reputation rehabilitation uh, operation that was going on for him. He was arrested in France at the end of last year, and in like January, February, somebody started registering all these domain names with his name in it and putting up very flattering websites that we, th that we looked at and said, okay, this seems to be like an SEO play to try and improve the results of this guy who has just been arrested and accused of fraud and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so we still don't know if or what the connection might be between these things, but like we were able to reach out to him and his foundation and sort of see, and we were able to you know, bring someone else into the story and be like, there's something kind of strange going on here. And that's even with an anonymized uh, address. The other thing uh, to note is that you know, along with that, that registration address, which means an entity that owns or is the holder of these websites um, is, is connected, the other thing that we noticed is that the, all of these websites, the one we were looking at and all of the ones assisting him were, were set up using a, a service called Wix.com, which is a really cheap and, and easy way to set up a website. So if you need to like crank out a bunch of websites quickly, Wix has uh, templates that you can do that with. So it was interesting that they used the same, they, they were all registered by the same anonymized email address. They all went online in roughly the same period of time. They were all built using Wix. So we start to build our kind of, our admittedly circumstantial evidence, but we start to see more and more connections as we dig into this data and look at it. Um, all right, so Google Analytics and AdSense. Google Analytics is a tool, it's a free tool, tons of people use to track the traffic on their website. And because it's a free tool, it's on tons and tons of websites. AdSense is Google's display ad network. Um, if you're a publisher and you sign up for AdSense and you get accepted, you can put ads on your site. The beautiful thing about both of these services is that once you are signed up for them, in order to make them work, you need to put some code on your website. And when you sign up for them, you are given a unique ID that in the code you put on your website will appear. So when we look at the source code of websites, we can go and search for Google Analytics IDs and Google AdSense IDs. So Google Analytics IDs begin with the prefix UA dash. Google AdSense IDs begin with the prefix pub dash. Um, and so I'm gonna walk you through what I'm showing here. But all this to say you may have a website with completely private domain name information on an IP address with tons of other websites, but you can go and use this technique to see if the same Google Analytics code shows up on the other websites. That's a very strong sign of a connection between them. Um, so here's what we do. Uh, we're on a website, we go up to the View menu, we go to Developer and we choose View Source, so that's gonna open a new tab with the source code of that particular web page. Um, and then we're gonna do a find on the page. So if we're looking for a Google Analytics code, we just put in UA dash, and lo and behold, it pulls it up. So it's UA dash, and then we've got a string of numbers after that, which would be a unique code to that particular Google Analytics account. And once we have that, uh, there it is, we can go to a free service called Spy on Web. Um, there's also a paid service called Analyze ID. It's not that expensive. It's pretty good. It's got, I think it's got a bigger database than Spy on Web. Um, but again, these things go online and offline all the time. So you never know how long they're gonna stick around for. Um, and just so you know, Spy on Web does allow you to just put in the URL, but I usually like to go into the code because oftentimes um, the, the codes have changed and their database may have the old code. It's still interesting to know what the previous code was and you can often use the Wayback Machine to see that, but I wanna I wanted check the one that's on the page right now. Um, and so when we put that in, you know, the one in my example that was for a site called Conservative Tribune, here's the report you get. So we see that it actually has two Google Analytics IDs on the page, that's common. You will often find more than one Google Analytics ID or AdSense ID. Um, and it also gives us a little breakdown of where it gets its traffic from. We're gonna dive into similar web more in a second. And we can see seven other domain names have that exact Google Analytics code. Um, and we can see other ones that, that have sort of a, you know, the two that are in there, we can see the domains that are connected to them. And then we have to go and continue our work of like, well, who's the domain name owner of these things? And so, you, you know, that's not like a, a perfect thing. You have to keep working, but it's a great indication that, hey, there's probably a connection between all of these sites. Um, all right, so just last couple tips on uh, website pieces. You know, if you're really curious about a website, you gotta, you know, click on all the links, reverse image search the images, where are they getting their content from, who are they linking to, are they linking to similar sites that are also connected to them, is there like an interlinking strategy going on here. Um, the CrowdTangle extension, this is where, you know, you look at pages on the site and try to figure out 
who's been sharing it? Um, is it the same pages over and over again? Is it the same Twitter account? Maybe they're connected. Um, so figuring out that network is, is that strain that runs through all of this kind of stuff. Um, again, to note, like the, if you've got the Wayback Machine plugin, you can look at previous versions of it. And I do encourage you to look at older versions of the, the site and look on the web page for those codes, because sometimes they do change over time. And you can see sort of originally where it had it. Or if you're on a site that today does not have an analytics code or an AdSense code, maybe six months ago it did and they removed it. Um, and so that's a way to start working on that as well. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, sometimes people are like stealing and plagiarizing content or what have you. So just taking some text and plugging it in. If they have bios of people on the site, maybe plug those bios in or they've been stolen from somewhere else or that kind of thing. So those are all other ways as you're trying to orient yourself around a website to kind of figure out what's going on there. Okay, last section. How am I doing here? Okay, wait, when did this start? Oh, okay, we're moving along pretty well. I told you I talk fast. I'm really sorry, okay? Um, but again, you have all the links, you have all the slides, so hopefully, uh, hopefully that's good. Okay, so Digital advertising is an absolute trash fire, disgusting, huge pig pile of corruption, okay? I just want to say that. Um, I started investigating ad fraud. I started trying to educate myself on it roughly a year ago. We've done like six investigations, and it's just unbelievable what's going on. Uh, roughly like $16 billion was stolen last year. In, in the digital advertising ecosystem, uh, you know, and, and we're here at a journalism conference that money being siphoned out of this ecosystem could be going to credible places. So fraud, I think, is one of the things that's really hurting journalism because it's hurting the revenue, it's hurting the business model. Um, so, so there's that piece of it. In, in addition to just like, that's an insane amount of criminality and nobody goes to jail. It's fucking insane. Okay. Um, all right. So here's what we're, here's what we're going to look at. When we look at a website and we're trying to figure out like what's going on with it, how are they acquiring their audience, some of the questions we have, like where do they get their audience? Where is it coming from? Is it social? Is it search? Are they, are they paying for ads on other websites to get their website, to get their audience? Um, how has that traffic changed over time? You often see websites doing different things to acquire audience over time, and if you see massive shifts in you know, where it gets its traffic from and the level of traffic, those are clues that, hey, something has changed here. Um, the other thing is you kind of look at the site itself and like what do they what do they appear to be and then where are they actually getting their traffic from and, and do these two things kind of make sense? Um, how are they, is, is, are they making money and if so, how are they doing that? So Ghostery is great in the sense of like what ad networks are they with and that kind of thing. Um, and Ghostery will tell you all of the ad tech that is on that particular page and site. And then the last thing is, you know, if there are ads there trying to figure out like wh what are the ads, where are they coming from? When we look at completely you know, fake news websites, there are a lot of brands that do not want to be on those. So looking and seeing what kind of ads are running there is often something that's a pathway to a story in and of itself. All right, so I'm going to do a, a little example of, of, uh, of a site that we investigated um, and found was committing ad fraud. And at this point, they basically admitted it, so we're OK to talk about this. Um, so there's an a international group of sites called the International Business Times. This is um, some data on similar web for their Indian edition. Um, and so, now I'll say we, we have access to a, a pro version of similar web, but you can still get a decent amount of data in the free version. Um, this is the kind of stuff you're going to see in the pro version. So what am I looking at when I start at it? Well, a, as a lot of us I think know, most news websites these days are getting a majority of their audience from mobile. So the first thing that stands out to me here is, okay, they've got almost 60% of their traffic is coming from desktop. That's a little bit weird. Like, why is that? And then I look over here, and I see the average visit duration is five minutes. That's, that's high. Like, people are spending five minutes on this website? That's, like, that's really above average. So we got two things that are not typical for news websites. And then the last thing we've got here is the pages per visit. So like more than three and a half pages per visit. So that looks like a tremendously engaged audience that for some reason is mostly visiting on desktop. Hmm, interesting, okay. Um, and then from there we can see like, so where is it coming from? Okay, yeah, okay, so we've got International Business Times India, and yet only about 35% of their audience is actually coming from India. So at this point, like, I'm looking at it saying, there's something that's not right here. You know, they've got tremendous engagement. They've got way too many desktop visitors. They've got an audience that doesn't seem to map to what they say they are. 
So that's all suspicious. And then we get into the marketing mix. This is where, the, where, the, where SimilarWeb says their audience comes from. Now, just as a sort of general caveat, like Alexa and SimilarWeb, they're good, again, like direction finding services. And I found that the data is pretty good. But like their actual exact percentages of traffic and things like that, those are going to vary. But it gives you a really good benchmark and you know general direction of where the audience is coming from. And w the thing that stands out to me here, first off, is that they're getting 20% of their traffic from display ads. So that straight up tells me they're buying audience. Okay, And there's lots of sites that do that. There's lots of people that do traffic arbitrage, where they pay a certain amount to run ads to get to get their audience, and as long as the amount that they have paid to get their audience is less than how much they earn from the ads on their site, they're making money. So that's very common. But if you're pitching yourself as a publisher with a very dedicated organic audience, and you're buying 20% of your audience, you know that's not what advertisers think they're paying for. Um, the other thing that stands out to me here is 40% direct. So that means, according to this, 40% of their audience is typing in the URL ibtimes.co.in. Now, I mean, there are sites with high direct audiences, but these are really well-established brands that have been around for a long time, have very loyal audiences. 40% for that is really high. And so that's suspicious to me because a lot of times what sites are doing, and I'm going to show you how this is done, is they're disguising their audience to make it look like it's organic referrals, or which means traffic coming from another website, like a link or what have you, or they're actually stripping out a lot of data so that when Google Analytics sees this user land on their site, Google Analytics says, well, I'm not really seeing where they came from. It looks like they just typed in ibtimes.co.in. And that, to an advertiser, it's like, listen, if you tell them, 40% of our traffic comes direct. They love our site. They spend five minutes on it. They read three and a half pages. Those look like great metrics, but they look great because they're fucking bullshit. Okay. Um, all right. So then the other thing that we look at is they say 20% of their, their traffic is coming from ads. Now we can see the ad networks. And, and, you know, so for me, the, I'm familiar with these ad networks. These are, you know, ad networks that will send you traffic that originates on porn sites or illegal streaming sites and things like that. So the ad networks that they're using to get their traffic is then the thing you want to look at. And what we're able to do here is see the websites that this traffic originated on. And I'm going to explain to you how that works in a second. And we can see here that, you know, these are, these are like a file sharing website. This is a Russian illegal streaming anime website. So this is not a case where they're running ads on really reputable places and people are clicking through. There's something else going on here. Last thing to note is this is the outbound stuff. So when people go on to the IB Times India website and then they click on links, where do they go? And what we see here is that they're basically referring traffic within their own network. So they're passing traffic around, which again helps obscure its origins and makes their analytics look better. So just from that report, we know that there's some weird stuff going on here, right? And learning how to read these kinds of reports will help tell you what is going on with the website, what kind of traffic they're getting, are they buying audience? Um, all right, so again, desktop way too high. They're, it's very clear that they're, they're buying traffic and it's low quality. It's not you know, placing ads on high quality websites. Um, they're re redirecting this traffic all around, which is a very common technique to kind of disguise traffic origins. And that time on site and number of pages per session, I mean, all of that becomes very suspicious once we see this kind of thing. Okay, so here's how it works. This is, um, this is a very common type of, of ad fraud that's going on today. People talk about bots, but a big problem in ad fraud right now and with fake audiences is not bot traffic, but bot, B-O-U-G-H-T, people buying traffic from websites and then disguising it to look organic. So what happens is, let's say somebody goes to a porn site or they go to an illegal streaming site and they find a video they want to watch, they click on it. Those sites are set up so that basically you click literally anywhere on the page and it opens a new window. It's called click jacking. You didn't ask for that window to open. You wanted to watch this video, but all of a sudden it's opened a new window in your browser and one of two things are gonna happen. It may pop up and you see the whole thing in front of you and then you have an option to close it. And instantly in that, that second when it pops up, any ads that have loaded will register as viewed ads and they're gonna make money right away from that. So that's like forced ad placement. Or the sneakier thing is they pop it under your browser window. So all you see is like for a second, hey, I didn't, what was that? Did I see something? And, and as you continue to watch your content of choice, 
in behind your main browser window, they have loaded a bunch of websites and they can cycle through them with multiple redirects. And so what you have is like the ability, once that browser window is open, to just go to town and load tons of websites and tons of content who have paid an ad network, who works with the porn or streaming sites, to load those things. So that's how you can buy this traffic. And it is human traffic because there's a human user there, but they didn't go to the website. They didn't choose to load that URL. And those ads that are being shown are not ads that in many cases they're actively viewing. Um, and so people will actually screw with some of the metrics to make it seem like a person is actively viewing all those ads. So this is a very common way to kind of generate that cheap traffic and buy it. And again, that traffic is really cheap to purchase. Here's, um, here's an example of it working for IB Times India. You go to kissanime.ru, all of a sudden um, IB Times has loaded. So that, that was an experience that I, when I was looking into it, I was able to capture. Um, and the thing that happened here that's really interesting is in that split second where you go from kissanime.ru to the IB Times site, I work at BuzzFeed so I made a GIF, that's, that's what we do. Um, it actually, if you watch in the, in the URL area there, you can see that it doesn't go directly from kissanime.ru. In this case, it routes through two other sites before getting there, which again obscures the origins of it. And in this case, one of the sites that it was going through was one called newsplatter.com. So when I see that, I go and I look at newsplatter, and I see all of a sudden this audience coming out of nowhere, 81% desktop, that's, that's a bit weird, um, 16 seconds on the site, um, and we can see here 44% display ads and the rest is direct. Super suspicious. And so what's going on is they're routing it, they're basically laundering the traffic through this other domain name so that by the time it gets to their website, it looks like organic traffic, it looks like direct traffic, and they can charge ads and advertisers who don't pay attention to this stuff are paying for it. Um, and, here, and just so you know, 99% of the traffic from newsplatter.com is going to IB Times India. So that, that URL exists to launder traffic to that website. That's basically what's going on here. And again, this is more and more common, and we see similar stuff that we saw on IB Times, right? Fortunately, SimilarWeb was able to track that and see what was going on there. Um, just another, uh, two other examples of investigations we did. So newsplatter.com, if you go to it, it looks like a news site that just aggregates headlines. Um, in two other investigations we did, what we found was people were actually setting up you know, large numbers of websites with the same kind of template and then routing traffic through them to launder it. This was a case where there were like 21 online arcade sites that were actually routing traffic to a subdomain on myspace.com that was committing video ad fraud. And then this one here, a site that does esports gaming, um, they set up uh, 25 different esports gaming websites bought traffic, routed it through them, exchanged it all around, and then spat it out on their main site. So people were like, oh, it's just referrals from other esports gaming sites. No, they were all owned by the same people. Uh, and they just set them up and just you know, auto-filled them with traffic. Uh, I've mentioned Alexa. Like similar web, it will give you some traffic data. It does have a free service. You can get some info there. One of the other ways that we can prove that these sites are there just to kind of launder and redirect traffic is that when we look at the Alexa traffic rank patterns, so this is Alexa ranks sites by traffic. When we look at the traffic rank patterns, all of these different sites had almost identical traffic rank patterns because they were basically just exchanging the exact same traffic, redirecting it between each other. So this is another thing you can look at if you're looking at multiple sites do they have similar kind of traffic rank patterns? Or is it identical? Because that's not how sites are supposed to be. People do not literally visit the same sites in the exact same order over and over and over and over again for months. That doesn't happen. It's, it's very suspicious. Um, it, it, that was an example of a site that was like with a reputable publisher and was real and had actual real people writing for it. This is an example from another investigation we did. The headline here on this site, on this post is Kylie Jenner's post Instagram posts a fascinating selection of shirts. Not that's not normal human English. That something has else has generated that. And this is really common and really easy. You buy a domain name, you set it up with Wix or WordPress, then you can pay like 60 bucks for a plugin, and you put in a bunch of RSS feeds from other websites, and it basically just takes their content and automatically remixes the words so that you have content on your website. Bada bing. Instant website, content uploaded every day, it, it gets past plagiarism detectors, and if you can get that site signed up with some ad networks, you can make money. And you've had to do nothing. You've, you've spent, like me, your out, outlay of cost is like $100 to get that up and running. As long as you can get in the ad networks, and then you go and you buy traffic, you can make money. Okay, so just to recap that piece of it, 
Um, so we're looking at the traffic and where it comes from and what that mix is. Um, we're really interested in the if they're buying traffic and that's clear, what are the ad networks? Because some are much higher quality than others. And you know, like some sites are very clear that looks, we buy traffic, we do arbitrage. The key is a site that is pretending to have a real audience but is actually buying it. Those are different things. Um, you know, where the bot traffic is coming from, again, the quality of those ad networks. Traffic, once it's on the site, what does it do? And what's the mix of desktop or mobile? Um, and of course, that organic versus paid is really important. And, and it, again, it also connects to what they are saying about themselves. What do they claim to be versus what all of the data is telling you they're actually doing and, and who they are? OK, here is our magical link that hopefully everybody has. OK, so does everyone have it? Does anyone need another second? You're good. OK, I know there were some people who came in late. OK, so write that down. That takes you to a Google Doc with every single tool that I have talked about, as well as all of my slides, as well as a bunch of links to other resources and stuff. I know I went through a lot of stuff. I threw a ton at you really quickly. Um, but hopefully, you can treat it as, one, you can go to the slides and look at stuff more closely. But two, there's other guides there. If there are things that you didn't really catch right away, there are tons of instruction things and guides on the internet if you need to figure out, OK, what was that Google Analytics code thing again? Lots of people have written up guides to all this stuff. So just use it as you know, a way for you to dive in deeper on things. OK, we have 10 minutes. I would like to take questions or comments if you're not completely overwhelmed right now. Yes, hello. Oh, microphone is coming. Just wait. Hey. Um, how concerned are you about the trend that domain registrars are going to start removing who is data and the impact of the uh, GDPR on, on who is? Hugely. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a real risk here that the who is data that has been an essential kind of uniform, universal place for, for data about the internet itself is, is being curtailed or removed. And this is something that security researchers are really banging a drum about, but it's like it's such an obscure technical thing to the average person that nobody really cares. But yeah, um, I'm very concerned about the who is data disappearing. Uh, I'm very concerned about going forward, what kind of data is going to be captured in that. And sure, I have, I have selfish interest in that. But there are a lot of people whose job is to fight malware and to fight other you know, really bad, corrosive things on the internet. And if they don't have access to that data, their jobs get harder too. So it's not just me wanting to have stuff to do stories. You know, the ability to make the internet safer for people could potentially be diminished if we lose this data. And you know, what's also happening now with the backlash against the Cambridge Analytica stuff, one, data privacy is a huge issue. Like, if you use Ghostery and you go to websites, you're going to see how much ad tech and tracking tech is on them. It's disgusting. It's out of control. Um, at the same time, you know, Facebook is trying to lock down its services. It's reducing access to some. It's closing off some features. And again, for researchers and journalists, this stuff was previously public, and it's now no longer public. They've reduced um, the data you can pull from APIs, like how much data you can get at a time. And, and I don't know how many of these things, like reducing access from an API, the privacy element of that is something to be discussed about. But at the end of the day, it means already opaque platforms are potentially getting harder and harder to hold accountable as well. So I'm just I'm worried about that trend overall. But I will also say that I mentioned this off the top. If you are using a tool as a crutch, uh, that tool will go away at some point. And and if you're not ready to replace it, if you don't understand the fundamentals of what it's doing and how it's giving you that information, you're you're going to be completely blind. Um, so good researchers and good journalists know about other ways of doing the same things because it's going to get turned off at some point. That is a reality of the internet. Uh, another question or comment, anyone? I have someone up front here. The microphone is coming. Two, okay, this will be the last question. Not really a question, but another tip. Uh, Martin Schenk from Lead Stories. Um, when you're investigating a, a photo or, or, or a social media post, the obvious first thing is to check the comments. I've, I've had that many times that I've spent half an hour reverse image searching and <laughs> tracking domain names. And then scrolling down the comments, finding, yeah, this is a photo from 2013, blah, blah, blah. So uh, don't forget to do the obvious first thing, too. Yep. So look at the comments on, um, on anything as well. 
Uh, you know, it can also be an article looking at the comments. Uh, I know a lot of journalists are like, don't read the comments, but you should read the comments. Um, the other thing on that to note, I mean, in general, everything can be fabricated and comments can also be fabricated. And what's happening with Facebook's algorithm change is it's valuing comments and discussion as a, as a, a metric to actually decide whether to give a, a piece of content more distribution. So what we have now are people gaming comments and you'll see like hundreds of people who have just like put a sticker or you know insane amounts of reactions that have all just been automated. So you also just have to question everything you're seeing because any of this stuff can be fabricated. You know, we just saw how an audience can basically be fabricated. Everything you're look at, looking at can be fabricated. So one, when you're using that data to make your conclusions, you have to keep that in mind. But two, that obviously is a great route to finding stories as well. Um, so keep that in mind. Thank you so much for coming to an early morning session. Uh, I'm gonna stick around for a few minutes as well if you wanna talk more. So thank you.